webinar ser series. This is the f for our five webinars in risk management. Today we're covering the topic of financial risk management. And uh, the topic today, we're starting with, is this a good budget and how can I tell? There's so many topics we could do for finance, uh, but the topic we've chosen, is this a good budget and how can I tell? I'll introduce Eric Plato, who's our speaker today in a moment. My name's David Hartley, and uh, it's a uh, real thrill to be able to have you on the line today. I hope you have brought lots of questions. Uh, we want to thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation and Citizenship and Immigration Canada for the funding that allows Ocasi to put this series on. Uh, let me just remind you in the red box there under A, pr please type your questions or comments during the presentation into the question box. Uh, otherwise, we won't be able to know that you have a question or comment. Your, your phones are muted during the webinar uh, because there's so many people on the line. So we can never hear you on the presentation. We can't hear you drinking coffee or coughing or anything. Uh, so please, would you be uh, gracious enough to send us your questions or comments, anything during the presentation. I'll be watching those and uh, we'll have a question and answer period at the end of today or if the questions are coming in and it seems appropriate, I might feed the questions to Eric during the presentation depending on the type of question. But at the very least, we'll be having a question and answer period at the end with Eric. I hope you really think of some good questions because to have Eric on the line, it's a, a phenomenal opportunity. Uh, I heard Eric speak the first time probably a couple years ago, I guess, um, at a conference here in Toronto. And there were a lot of speakers, and I remember how many people lined up to speak to Eric afterwards because he really is the kind of person you feel comfortable talking to. He's, he's very, very sharp, but at the same time very, very uh, uh, much the kind of person that you, that you can come and ask questions to. There really won't be any stupid questions, so if you have a question today, please don't think it's a stupid question. If you have a comment, please make it. And we really want to make this as interactive as possible. Um, so I'm very, very glad that you, that you joined today. A couple of cartoons for you here. Uh, this is for, I'm always working with nonprofits, so this is a good one. I, my wife, we saw uh, this morning, never ever give up. So here's a frog. <laughs> it's just, he's not going to give up. And so sometimes you have to think that way, especially with budgets and a nonprofit. So it's really much financial risk management. Uh, here's another one for you. Said, what you doing today? I said, nothing. She said, you did that yesterday. I said, I wasn't finished. <laughs> so a couple uh, funny little cartoons for you. So here we are. We're, in the, we're doing the five webinars. All of them are from 10.30 to noon. Um, we've done the introduction to risk management, safe steps part one, the screening uh, of volunteers and staff, safe steps part two we did last week, and that's risk proofing volunteers and paid staff after they join. Today we're doing manage, managing your financial risk, it's, uh, a real key piece in that, and that's your budget. And then next Wednesday, we'll be doing governance risk, creating an engaged, effective nonprofit board. I'll be doing that next Wednesday. It's going to be very good. Uh, it sounds like a boring topic. It's anything but. There's some fantastic material that can help you to really create a great board. Uh, the three goals we have with these uh, five Ocasi webinars, number one, help you find practical ways to find and manage your key risks, help you engage your people so policies and tools actually work, and to try and make this as engaging as fun as we can. Um, now, you might say that's impossible with finance, and maybe that's true. But the one thing I can tell you is we're going to do our best to try to make these engaging. Um, Petra is running the OrgWise uh, the forum the website. And if, if you have never accessed it or you're having trouble accessing it, you can email Petra. Petra's in the room. Hello, Petra. Uh, and you email her and ask her how to have access. You're going to see all the webinars from the past that we're doing. They're all going up there, including a lot of additional resource documents that I think you're really going to enjoy. So uh, the one other thing I hope you do today before we uh, launch a few polls here to ask a few questions is, would you please remember to keep a side piece of paper on your desk? Uh, you might call it a bright ideas page or practical things I learned from Eric today page or things I'm going to implement. Um, things that really are practical that you can use, would you keep a side piece of paper of some kind? We're going to ask you at the end of the presentation what sort of ideas uh, wrote down uh, that were really valuable to you. So in other words, there's going to be a lot of things that Eric's going to talk about today. But are there things that you can practically put into place, so ideas you thought, wow, I'm going to do that, uh, that sounds great. Um, some ideas you may have got during the presentation that were triggered. So I'm going to ask you at the end of, of, to, of the presentation today, how many ideas, how many thoughts did you write down? And if you're willing maybe to tell us a couple of them, that would be great. So I'll start off by uh, uh, launching some polls here, Petra. 
So the first poll we're going to launch is asking you about your role in the organization. So if you could answer uh, this one, please, just click on one of those. So what's your, what's your role in the nonprofit? Are you a board member? Are you an executive director? Are you a CEO, um, finance staff, other staff? So please go ahead and click on those. We can see, uh, Eric, you can see it in the right there. So 62% of you voted, 69% of you voted, and 77% have voted. So keep voting there. 85% of you voted. Okay, so it looks like most of you are executive director, 45%, uh, 36% would be other staff, 18% finance staff, and we have no board members on the line. So uh, about half the people on the line, Eric, are executive directors, um, and the next 36% other staff, and about one in five are finance staff. So that's great. I know how it works in nonprofits. Oftentimes you're doing finance and you also do HR, you do many different things. So that's great. Uh, let's open up the next poll. So here is a question, what's your organization's annual budget? So, you know, is it 100,000 or lower? Is it 100,000 to 250? 250 to a million or over a million dollars? Does this help Eric as he, as he talks today to kind of know the, the organizations that are on the line? So 62% of you have voted, so keep voting there. Okay, 69% have voted. So just those of you who haven't voted, just go ahead and click one of those options. Okay, 77% have voted. Okay, so 82% of you said your budget's over a million dollars. 18% said between 50,000 and a million. So that gives us a good idea. And the final poll. The final poll, we're just going to ask you about your experience with budgets. So what's your experience developing budgets? Have you never developed a budget? You have minimal experience, you're quite experienced, or very experienced. So 23% of you have voted. Sixty-nine percent of you have voted. Yolanta just sneezed. Welcome. The boss is here in the house. Uh, Seventy-seven percent have voted. All right. Okay, so it's really split. 36% of you said minimal experience, 36% said quite experienced, and 27% said very experienced. Nobody said they had no experience, but minimal, quite experienced, and, and that some of you, okay, there we go. So 42% minimal, 33% quite experienced, 25% very experienced. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much for that. Well, let me introduce you to, uh, today to our speaker. Uh, he's Eric Plato. If uh, uh, we've now done quite a lot of work together over different, many conferences and webinar series, and uh, it's such a pleasure to have Eric here. He was the controller at the YMCA of Greater Toronto with a huge budget, and he's now the director of the fi of finance for the Frontier College, which is also a nonprofit. Uh, he really has uh, a terrific, wholesome ability to make financial information palatable for non-financial nonprofit leaders, which I think we have, uh, you know, mostly on the line today. So uh, just go ahead here, we'll the microphones and we'll get Eric Plato on the line. And we want to thank you, Eric, very much for joining today. Thanks, David. Uh, I'm really happy to be here today. And this is all about budgeting, but what I'd like to do over the course of um, the next hour or so is I want to first talk about financial management and where budgeting fits into um, financial management in an organization. And then we'll get into budgeting, talking about best practices. And I've done a lot of budgets over my years working in finance and doing budgets for small organizations and large organizations. So, you know, organizations with budgets of $100 million. I've also um, been involved with organizations where the budget's been under $100,000. But the principles of budgeting are the same. and so. I'll share with you some of my experiences um, putting together budgets, um, evaluating budgets, um, which hopefully will help you, and some of the tricks that I've been able to use over the years. And then finally, the evaluation of a budget. How do you know whether it's a good budget? Um, because you may be in a situation where um, you have to make a decision. Does this budget get approved or not? 
Um, so we'll go over that, and then uh, any questions you may have, I uh, would be happy to try and answer them. So let's get into it. And what is financial management? And I think this is important because financial management is not just about keeping the accounting records, and it shouldn't, financial management shouldn't be seen as just something that finance staff take care of. In practice, financial management is about taking action to look after the financial health of the organization and not leaving things to chance. So that's when I say it entails planning, organizing, controlling, and monitoring the financial resources uh, to achieve the objectives. And it involves managing, really managing a few things. Managing scarce resources. You want to make sure that um, donated funds and resources are used properly and to the best effect. You're managing risk and that's both internal risks and external risks. You need to manage them to limit any damage that they could cause to the organization. Um, it involves managing strategic. So financial management is part of management of the organization as a whole. Um, you need to look at the medium and long term, uh, not just projects or particular programs. So looking at the big picture. And then managing by objectives. Financial management involves paying close attention to um, project and organization objectives. And I think the most important thing to remember is the financial management takes place on a continuous basis. It's not a, um, a one process or one activity thing you do and, and it's forgotten about. It's continuous. So one of the other things we talk about is financial control. And really at the heart of financial management is the concept of financial control. So this occurs when you have your systems and procedures to make sure that the financial resources are being properly handled. And it is very important. If you have poor financial control in the organization, that's when, you're, when you run the risk of um, theft or fraud or abuse. Um, one of the things that could happen is funds may not be spent in accordance with the donor's wishes. And if the financial control is really poor, the competence of the managers uh, may even be called into question. So who's responsible for financial management? So ultimately, it's the board that's responsible for the financial affairs of the organization. And I know because I've served on boards, and many boards I always want someone with financial experience, and usually everything is deferred to the treasurer. And I know we don't have board members on, on this call, on this webinar, but if someday you happen to be on a board or ask to I think it's important for you to understand that all board members are responsible for the financial management of the organization, not just the treasurer. Now, ultimately the board's responsible, but obviously they do delegate authority. So they're going to delegate authority to the ED or president or CEO, and then again things are delegated further down the line. Um, but the board can't delegate total responsibility. In practice, Everybody who works to achieve the objectives, the mission of the organization, has a role to play in financial management. And I think you'll see this um, over the course of the, the next while. So I want to look at some of the principles of financial management. So custodianship. And when I talk about custodianship, um, this refers to the stewardship or safekeeping of the organization's resources. You need to make sure that the assets and the funds that the organization has are used in accordance with any contractual agreements that you have, whether it's a government or uh, private sector funders. Accountability, and I'm sure everybody uh, knows about accountability, we talk about it all the time. I mean, I see it as a moral or legal duty placed on, or there's an individual or group organization to explain how the funds have been used. Transparency. So transparency, you should have systems established whereby all the financial information is recorded accurately, it's presented clearly, and it can be easily be disclosed to anyone who has a right to see it. Because if it, you haven't achieved that, it can give the impression that you're trying to hide something. Even if you're trying to hide something, if you don't have those systems in place and if you can't present information clearly, people might think that you're trying to hide something. So that's important. Consistency, so the financial systems of an organization um, should be consistent year to year so you can actually make comparisons. Now it doesn't mean that systems can't be refined, um, but what you want to be careful about 
is that you don't have inconsistent approaches to financial management because that could be viewed as you're trying to manipulate something. So how do you account for fund certain expenses? You want to be consistent on how you do that. Integrity. So I think about the honesty or reliability of the organization and the individuals in the organization um, that there should be no question about um, the proper financial management. Um, there really can be no doubt on how the funds were utilized and the records must reflect a true reflection of reality. So you're not trying to adjust the books to make things look better than they actually are. It has to be real. Non-deficit financing. Um, I think about this is when you're setting out to achieve certain objectives, you want to make sure you have sufficient funding to cover all the costs. Because if you don't, um, what you end up doing is you make commitments that may not be fulfilled, and then you end up using resources that may ultimately be wasted. So if you are setting out to deliver a particular service to your community or clients, you want to make sure that you can deliver on that. Not start something and then halfway through saying, well, I'm sorry, we have no more money, we're pulling out. Um, that's not something that you want to do um, to your participants. And then eventually, as I said, you could waste resources. You spent resources in half a year and never were able to achieve your objectives. And then the final one, standard documentation. I'm talking here about the system of maintaining financial records. And some of you may have heard of um, something called GAAP, which is generally accepted accounting principles. And really what it is, it's, it's the rule book for accounting, how transactions are recorded. So there's a rule book on how revenue and expenses are recorded. You just want to make sure in your organization that who's ever responsible for that, that they're following those rules. And when auditors come in at the end of the year, they're looking to make sure that you've followed the rule, followed GAAP. So that's an overview, quick overview of financial management. Um, when we look at building blocks of financial management, and there's four of them, and I'll sh tell you where budgeting fits into here. So first of all, we've got accounting records. So you need to keep an accurate account of financial transactions just to show how the funds were used. And the accounting records provide the information on how the organization is being managed and whether it's achieving its objectives. So this is sort of the bookkeeping part of it. Um, we're not talking about this today, but that's an important part of financial management. Then you've got financial planning. And the planning, this is linked to the organizational strategic and operational plans. And it's the budget that's the cornerstone of, really, the cornerstone of any financial management system. And that's what we're really going to focus on today. Third one is financial monitoring. So if you've got a budget put together, um, you've got accounting records because you have a finance person or a bookkeeper, whoever it is that's keeping good records, then it's quite easy to produce timely financial reports, which allows managers to assess the progress on how the organization is doing. So monitoring is something that has to happen continually. And then finally, internal controls. Um, so this is the system control, so checks and balances to safeguard the organization's assets and to manage internal risk. And so the purpose of internal controls, one is to defer, defer um, or deter theft or fraud, and it also can detect errors and omissions in the accounting system because there's lots of entries, there's a lot of um, bookkeeping entries. Mistakes will happen, sometimes things are missed, and some of the internal controls are in place to make sure things aren't missed, to check the things that could go wrong. So it's not only about um, fraud or theft, because there will be error emissions. And if you do have an effective internal control system, it also protects the staff that are involved in financial tasks. One of the things I'll say about the building blocks, what's really important is that you have all of these in place. You can't just have three out of the four. So if any one of them is missing, you're not going to have a good a good financial management system. You're not going to have good financial control. So if you don't have good accounting records, you may have, you know, be monitoring, you may have internal controls, but if the books aren't kept properly, then you're not going to be able to um, monitor, monitor your finances the way you want to because you'll have inaccurate information. 
you need to have a budget, you need to do the monitoring, and you need to have those internal controls. So they all work together, and they all have to be working to have effective financial control and a financial management in an organization. So let's get to budgets, because uh, that's what we're focusing on today, and this is the financial planning block of financial management. So there's lots of reasons why we do budgets, and I know um, my experience has been people hate budget time. Um, it takes a long time. It's sort of people dread the whole budget process. I'm one of these people who loves the budget process. It's probably one of my favorite times of the year. There's many reasons why we why you do um, go about doing budgets, and I put a few of them up here. Obviously, it ensures planned and thoughtful allocation of available resources. It enhances management control. The third one for me is probably the most important. It stimulates the evaluation of efficiency and effectiveness of service delivery. Because what I find is during the year, you're so busy just doing your day-to-day -day work, sometimes you just don't have time to step back and think about how are we delivering our services. Is there a different way we deliver our services that might be more efficient, that might free up some resources so that we can do something else that we want to do? And so what I find useful during the budget time, that's the time when you can actually sit down, think about the actual program, think about the way services are delivered. And you may have been doing the same thing in the same way for a number of years, and so maybe the budget, the budget process, if you do it properly, is a time when you can think about that. We've been doing it this way for so many years. Is there another way that we could go about doing this where we could serve more people or free up resources to do something else that we'd like to do? A few other um, reasons to do budgeting. It flags for upcoming changes and allows for advanced planning for them. So if you have government funding and you know that that government funding may end um, sometime in the next 12 months, you can plan for that. What are you going to do? What changes need to be made? could be um, your rents going up, um, whatever changes are out there that you need to, to plan for, going through that budget process, that's when you can actually plan, okay, what are we going to do? Six months from now, we may have a problem, we have to figure out what we're going to do. What are the different scenarios? Budgeting provides a performance measure. So for many managers and staff, that's part of their performance evaluation. Did you make your budget target? And for some organizations, you need to set aside some money to deliver on some commitments. It could be a loan repayment. Um, if you have, maybe it's for a building, you need to generate some money to pill, uh, pay for some large expense. So you can do that in the budgeting process if you know you have to put aside money for something, um, for a big item. So types of budgets. Um, just wanted to talk about three. The first one I think everybody knows about. It's pretty straightforward. Your income and expenditure budget. You know, you budget how much money is going to come in. You budget how much money you're going to spend and where you're going to spend it. Pretty straightforward. A capital budget. Um, many of you may not see this or it may not uh, apply. Um, capital budgets you generally find in larger organizations, particularly if you have, if you own property, a building, Capital budgets, these are expense items, the big ticket items. Uh, so, for example, if you owned a building and you know you're going to have to replace the roof in a couple of years, that's something that would be a capital item. Um, any big, it could be, it might not be machinery or equipment that needs to be replaced. So capital budgets, very often you'll see a capital budget, a three or a five year capital budget. So you're looking ahead. So this year everything may be fine, but three years from now we're going to have to replace the roof. It's going to cost us $50,000. So where's the $50,000 going to come from three years from now to replace the roof? So it's planning for that, knowing what these big ticket items are. So if you don't have a building, um, the other place where I've sometimes seen this is people plan their IT expenditures that way, because sometimes that can be a significant um, expense. People have might have a um, a schedule on when computers are being replaced. So you might, over the next three years, we're going to have to replace computers, maybe it's servers. That may or may not be a significant um, expense line in your budget. That's going to vary from organization to organization. But it might be useful just to think about, um, in terms of IT, 
how many computers are you going to have to replace over the next three years, and will you have the funds to do that? Where is the money going to come from? And then the third one is cash flow. Cash flow is important, and my experience over the years is people often forget about the cash flow because you spend so much time doing your income expenditure budget. It takes a long time. You want to get it balanced, but even though you have a balanced budget, you might still have a problem with cash flow. This happens, um, I've seen it happen with smaller organizations where you have one major funder that's giving you all your money. So you know they're going to give you all of the money you need for all of the expenditures. But the real question is, when are you actually going to receive the money? So are you spending money before you actually get the money back from the funder? Are you doing things based on claim forms? And so if you have to do a claim form at the end of the month, maybe you get it in by the 15th of the next month. By the time you receive the check, it might even be 30 days later. In the meantime, you're paying your staff every month. Do you have enough cash in the bank to cover the expenditures? So the cash flow budget and the income and expenditure budget are very different. You can have a balanced budget, income and expenditure, but you could have cash flow issues during the year. And I have seen situations where people sort of only realize that, you know, partway through the year or it's sort of a, a crisis point where cash flow is a real problem. Whereas you've thought about that at the beginning of the year, you could be able to manage that in a much better way. And I wanted to just show you an example, um, simple example of what a budget would look like. So this is the income expenditure budget, um, you know, revenue at the top, expenses below. Um, I'll talk about some of these notes in a minute, but that's a, a fairly standard um, budget. This capital budget, this is what a capital budget might look like if you're doing one for five years. So you can see the categories, the things you might want to put in there, computers, brickwork, roof replacement. Um, it can be useful if you look, you know, three years in, you need $33,000 for the capital expenditure. So for some organizations, coming up with an extra $33,000 could be quite a challenge. Where's the $33,000 going to come from? So you want to plan three years ahead of time, you know you're going to get the 33. Okay, we've got to come up with the money, generate the money to be able to do this work because if we're, we don't replace the roof, if we don't do these things when they're scheduled, it could be even more problems. Then you're dealing with a, potentially a crisis situation. You don't have the money. You put it off. You put it off. It can end up being more expensive for you. So it's, sometimes it's good to have those things planned out for the next three to five years. So that's an example of what a capital budget might look like. Cash flow. So I've just done a simple, like, you know, five months here cash flow. Um, so if you start March five thousand dollars, and here it's a case where you know revenue is a hundred thousand dollars. What you do is you put in what month do you think the money is actually going to come in, and on the expense line, when is the money actually going to go out? Because if most of your expenses for most organizations, salaries and benefits are, is the biggest expense. And so it's going to be pretty consistent month after month. Revenue may not necessarily be consistently coming in. You might not get the same amount every month, depending on your funder. And so that's something that when I get a contract from a government, one of the first things I look at is, when are we actually going to get the funding? Do they give you an advance up front? Is it based on a claim form? What's the schedule for the actual money coming in? And then I look at, okay, when are we actually going to be spending the money to make sure that we actually have the cash to spend for it. I think people sometimes forget about that. You're so excited when you actually get the contract. Going through those details, I think it's really important uh, to do that, particularly for cash flow purposes. So approaches to budget. So incremental budgeting, zero-based budgeting, you probably, you may know these terms, but incremental budgeting Basically, what you do is you look at this year's actuals, um, you add on a percentage, and you're done. And it's pretty simple to do a budget. Uh, it can be useful where there's not a lot of change year to year, but it's not the best way to do the budget. It's not the most accurate way to do a budget. What I like to do is zero-based budgeting. Basically, you're, you're starting with a, a slate. It's where you go through and justify every expenditure that's in the budget. What it does, it's, it provides a more accurate budget. Um, 
because then you've got then you know you've gone through everything you really know what the costs are you really know where your money is going the downside or, or what you need to be aware of it takes more time it definitely takes more time to do that but it is more accurate if you're in a situation where your organization is changing a lot um, increasing or decreasing you really want to use zero based budgeting in practice in reality and I do this too it's a it's a combination of both because if you think of things if you're budgeting for telephone expense it's pretty pretty much going to be the same as last year you know what your phone bill is going to be it doesn't take a lot of time for that but things like program expenses that's where you want to spend the time that's when you really don't want to know how is the program being delivered what do I really need in that line to deliver um, the services the last section top down bottom up so top down that's when basically your supervisor or manager gives you a budget or gives a budget to the staff and say here you here's your budget um, go to it bottom up is where you have staff involved in developing a budget and this is the this I would say is best practice in terms of doing budgeting I know for myself and my organization um, I'm the finance person but I wouldn't do people's budgets for them because I'm not delivering the service the people that should be putting together the budget are the people that should be delivering the service they're the ones that know what resources are required to run the program so I'm depending on them to tell me how much does it cost what's the program all about what do you need to run this program and then they're the ones to put the, together the budgets and then the budgets come to me so it doesn't mean that I don't give some guidelines certainly when the budget process comes you want to give guidelines to staff on on what they should be doing maybe we can spend up to this amount but when it gets down to the details you're much better to involve the people who are delivering the service to put together the budget again that's how you get a more accurate budget so some of the other best practices in budget and here's where I can definitely tell you some of the stories that I've learned over the years and the mistakes that I've learned first of all clarity and for me this is really important and that what I'm talking about here is keep notes I like to have a lot of notes about the budget it's not just the numbers the notes are really important so you saw in the example that I had before there were some notes beside each um, and I'll go back to it beside each line there's some notes so um, even things like phone um, six hundred dollars per month something like that just so you know what's in there program expenses um, I put workshop conferences equipment so you have a sense in what's in each budget line this is a very simplified one sometimes the budget notes will be more um, more complex than this it's really important for a couple of reasons if I'm going to approve a budget or somebody needs to approve the budget how can they approve a budget if they don't know what's in these numbers I would never approve a budget without some kind of explanation and so the budget notes are really the most important thing to me the other thing that's happened to me is you inherit a budget that somebody else put together so changes happen in the organization somebody leaves hires somebody new they're taking over I've seen this happen many times the person new starts they want to purchase something and they ask the question well can I buy this is this in the budget there's no notes and so there might be something in program expenses but you don't know or they're not sure whether this particular item or this particular expense is in there or not so it gets very confusing to manage a budget without the notes if there were notes in there then you would be very clear okay this is what was planned for the year this is where we plan to spend the money here's an expenditure that that's come up does it fit within the plan not within the plan but without any notes it's it's very difficult for somebody to come in to, to inherit a budget without having any notes on on where um, money was expected to be spent the same as money coming in um, fundraising like how is that money going to be generated and I know sometimes um, that tends to be a plug-in budgets so you're a bit short and you say well we'll do some fundraising for it and so when I look at budgets I want to know what the fundraising is so how exactly are we going to raise the money so if it's special events then I want to know what the events are rather than just saying well we'll figure it out when are these events going to be run when are they like is it reasonable to expect that we're going to raise 
In this case, it's sixty thousand dollars in special events. So all of those notes are really important. And the more notes you have, the better it is. The easier it is for somebody to um, review your budget and make a decision: yes or no, we approve it or not. Second one is timetable. Um, for an organization that's budget, you want to prepare a timetable for budget. And just remember, it usually takes longer than you think if you're going to do a budget properly. Um, so for example, in our organization, we have a, a, our year is April 1st. We started planning our budget back in November. That's when it first started talking about the budgets. So it does take some time. You're trying to figure out what kind of programs you're going to do. What are the changes that are going to happen? Um, more time, the better. I do know, in reality, sometimes you're doing um, budgets for government. They don't give you a lot of time. So something comes out, um, you want to put a budget together, you don't have a lot of time. It's like you got to turn it around in a week. So whenever you get these, you know, you, it's a request for proposal. As soon as it comes out, don't leave it to the last day, like, you know, the day before it's due to sort of put together the budget. Think about that early. Because what I've found, and from my experience, is when things have been done at the very last minute, that's when things have been forgotten, and the budgets end up either they don't get approved because they were done so fast that they weren't really done that well, or sometimes they could be, maybe you get the money and then you realize, hmm, we didn't really budget well, we, you know, we didn't have time to think through how we're going to do this, and so there's some expenses that we're going to need to run this, but we didn't put it in the budget because we didn't think about it at the time we did it. So give yourself time to do a budget properly. Budget headings. So by budget headings, I'm talking about um, chart of accounts. If you don't know what a chart of accounts is, it's basically a list of all the revenue and expenses that your organization is tracking. And so when the budget process starts, one of the things I like to do is have a list. Here are all the things that we're going to track. Like what types of expenses are we going to track? What types of revenue are we going to track? Sometimes you're, if you're funded by the government, that may dictate how you're going to track things. So for example, are you going to, you might have a lot of supplies, are you going to have an expense line for photocopy or is that going to be put into office expense? Um, program materials, is everything under program materials or maybe food is a major item that you're spending. Maybe you want to track food separate from program materials, but maybe you don't need to track it. So program materials may include food and all of these other things. If it's training, so what's included in training expense? So as long as well as having a list of the different categories, what's included in those categories? Um, that's important too, because what I find sometimes is people don't know what to what's training, what's office supplies. So if you photocop photocopy something for training, do you put it into office expense or do you put it into training? So sort of what I like to do is answer those questions at the beginning of the year and have basically here is the chart of accounts, here's the list of all the expenses, here's what's included all the expenses. It just helps people when they're budgeting so they know how much to put where. Next one is estimating costs. So again, you need to justify the expenses and the revenue that you're putting into your budget. So if you're doing some estimates, and there are estimates in the budget because it's about the future, you can't predict everything exactly. Um, the most common one I would think would be around staff benefits. And that's a question that um, people sometimes ask me, how much do I budget for benefits? So generally, and I think many organizations will do this, you'll budget benefits based on a percentage of salary. And so if it's 15% or 20%, then in my description for beside benefits, I would put in benefits, 20% of salaries. That would be my description. So that people would see that, they say, okay, that looks reasonable. If you had 40% saying 40%, that doesn't make sense. If it was 5%, okay, that's definitely not enough. So just having that in there, again, it's good for clarity so people understand and they know, okay, we have enough in there for benefits. And you have some justification for how you calculated that number. Just as I was saying, phone expense, if it's $600 a month or whatever it happens to be, just justify the costs in there, particularly your estimates. Contingencies. 
So budgets are about the future. You're doing a budget, you know, could be three months before the year starts and you're budgeting for things that are going to happen a year, more than a year, um, further out. So you do want to have some contingency in your budget for those things that come up that are unexpected. And it's totally normal and it happens all the time that some expense will happen during the year that you didn't predict when you put your budget together. And the thing is, how do you put a contingency in there? What you don't see in a budget is a lot called contingency at a dollar amount just sitting there. How you would put a contingency is you would put extra money in relevant budget lines. So the lines that I would say were I would put a contingency, benefits is, benefits is one that I always use. And the way that I go about doing this, I look at the previous year and look at benefits. What was the percentage? What is the actual cost of the benefits? What percent was it? So if it was something like 18.7% was the actual benefit cost, I'll put in 20% for benefits. So I always know that there's a bit of cushion in my budget in the benefit line. I always budget a bit more, and I'd always, really the way I think about it is, if every staff was on benefits, the full amount, like the maximum amount, what would I need to budget? That's what I like to put into the benefit line, knowing that not everyone is on benefits if someone is new. They might not be in benefits for three months. Some are in single, some are in family, whatever it is. You know there's going to be some uh, variances in there, but I always know I have extra money there. If you've got in your budget, if you've got a building, you have maintenance, that's a place where you want to put in some extra money because things are going to come up with maintenance in your building. Um, so that makes sense to have some extra money in there for unexpected expenses. A couple of other places that I've seen it, insurance. So, and this just depends whether you know exactly what your insurance is going to be for the year. If you don't know, if it's, you know, partway through the year when you find out what your, how your insurance renewal is going to go, I usually put some extra money in there. And then another one, sometimes it's salaries, so I usually round up with salaries. So depending on how your salary scales go or how you pay people, if, you, if there's a salary and say it was um, $44,500, I put the salary in at $45,000. I'd round up to the next thousand, so it gives you a bit of money there. And if something happens during the year, if somebody's off sick for a period of time and you need to bring someone in on a part-time basis, it gives you a bit of money in those lines. So those are four places anyways where it's very common to put a bit of extra money in. And then finally, the forgotten costs. And very often, when budgets go wrong, when you end up the year in a deficit, it can go back to poor budgeting. And some of the costs that were forgotten. And this has happened to me, and this has happened even with the project. And I will give you an example because it's, it's, I learned from this. This was a case where um, apply for a government grant, actually got it. It was great. Everyone's so happy. We could get a new staff, start a new program. So the first thing is, okay, we, great, we can hire a new staff. So we had to put an ad in Lewis Charity Village. The invoice comes in. Someone gives me an invoice saying, okay, where do we code this? And I'm thinking, well, where do we code this? There was nothing in the project budget for recruitment of staff. So here we have, whatever, a $200 bill. There's no money to pay for it. So you hire the person, and then, of course, the person's going to start. First thing, you've got to set up their workstation. So have a desk. Okay, that's good. Then, of course, they need a chair. And then someone comes, well, actually, the chair actually isn't a good chair. We can't use that for the person. It was an old chair that no one used. It was sitting aside in a, in a boardroom, but it's really not a good chair. It's not a, we need to get a new chair. There's nothing in the budget for office furniture, so we don't have, we have to buy a chair. Then it's a computer. Well, we're going to get a new computer. Did you put a computer in the budget? So where is the money for the computer going to come from? So then it was the computer. And the next thing was they're probably going to need a filing cabinet. There's no money in there for a filing cabinet. So just it was just going on and on. I realized, you know, we've forgotten all the startup costs for hiring a staff. Like we've, we're so concerned about getting that money for a salary. It's everything else that goes with having a new staff. In an actual case, that program ended up running a deficit because we didn't have all the money we need. So what I've done, um, and it's been very useful, is have a checklist. If you have a new staff, here are the things that, it's, it's not just their salary, it's recruitment, 
it's a desk, it's a chair, a computer, a filing cabinet. Sometimes it might be a phone. In fact, I remember a situation where, um, and this is a mid-sized organization where the phone system maxed out, and they actually had to upgrade their phone system. They didn't plan on that. It's thinking about those types of things. Having the list and putting a dollar value to it, it's very useful so that whenever I see a new proposal, I can go to that checklist. Okay, do we need to put this into the budget? You may have some of these things. Maybe you have a computer. Maybe you have a desk but you just want to go through that checklist and make sure it's accounted for. Because if you do have it, the other reason this is very useful, a lot of funders are looking for your contribution. So you're going for funding and they always ask, okay, how much are you asking for us and how much are you putting in? So now it's something that we can include. This is our contribution to the project. Because those are real costs, all of this furniture. So we use that as our contribution. So we, I found that very useful for checking budgeting for doing project proposals to basically recognize the contributions of the organization. Some of the other things in forgotten costs are um, equipment maintenance. Some of these things that happen once a year, you forget about them at budget time. So that it's like a, a maintenance contract, you pay it once a year. Software licenses or, or support. So again, it's when I've seen these type of things, I have a little checklist. Of these were missed during the year, so then when I'm in a budget, when I'm evaluating a budget internally for our organization, I go through those things to make sure that they're budgeted somewhere. And it's just from learning, it's from the mistake of going through a year when it's forgotten that I've actually keep that little checklist. So those are my sort of best practices in budgeting. Let's get, actually get to the planning. Um, so the fiscal plan should be driven by the program plan, not created in isolation. The biggest mistake people make when they do budgets is they start right away on the numbers. People want to get those numbers on the page, when in reality, the numbers is the last thing to do. Actually, that's the easiest thing to do. Where you want to start with your organization is your strategic plan, your objectives. What are you trying to do? How are you going to deliver the services? Like going through the steps of figuring out, and I mean really going through the steps. How is the program be, be delivered? Where? When? How many people are involved? What are the resources needed to do it? Once you have all that together, then you can assign dollar amounts to it. That would be the last thing. And again, as I said before, you want your budget to be zero based, not just last year in a percentage, because the environment's changed. So, what happened last year, things could look very different this year. You may have to change your program because of something that's happened in the community, uh, changes in the community, changes in the environment. So all budgets have assumptions um, because it's about the future. And it's important to be able to state and support any of these assumptions. And I sort of divide them in internal assumptions and external assumptions. So internally, this would be things like, salary increases. So say you're going to have a 2% salary increase. That would be one of the assumptions that you'd have in there. New programs. What new programs or services are you going to offer as an organization? Then externally, um, what's happening with your government contracts? Um, what's, hap what's happening on the political scene that may affect your program? Is there new legislation that's going to, to affect um, your program or additional costs that you need? The demographics, are the demographics changing from year to year? That could affect what you're doing. Even things like rental costs, if you're renting space, maybe space you got for free, maybe you have to pay for now. Maybe the space isn't available, that type of thing. And like I said, other things, interest rates, there's lots of different things. Um, the, but the most important thing, I think, is that you need to actually document all of these things. And that should be part of your budget package as well. So we look at revenues. So your program plan combined with your pricing or funding provides your revenue figures. For some organizations, if most of your money is coming from the government, it's pretty simple. Your revenue will be pretty simple. It will be given to you. They'll tell you how much money they're going to give to you. If you have a fee for service component in your program, then you need to think about how many people are going to be purchasing the service that you're offering, 
um, how much are you going to to get per person per per service whatever it is the second point is considering capacity limitations so your funding from the government may determine your capacity limitation that's all that you have so you can't do more than what's um, than what's in the contract but some of the other things to think about are space restrictions I've seen people in their budgets to make their budget work they'll say well you know what there's we could actually serve more people than we originally have in the budgets increase the number of participants thinking that they'll get more money that way or or that might be a good way to deal with some budget issues but do you have the space how many participants can you serve in the space that's available and just making sure and that's actually something I check on too when I look at a budget when I see the numbers how many people are going to be served is it realistic can it actually physically be done given the space given the time that's that's available another thing around capacity is and this is one that I think everyone forgets is the capacity of the human resources of the organization because we're all stretched I think that's just typical of the sector we're all trying to do a lot we probably do a lot more than you know we can you just have to be cognizant of how much your staff can actually do adding more and more and more at a certain point you come to the breaking point so just being aware of at what point are you going to need additional staff to actually deliver the service and it might be part-time staff maybe it's a certain time during the year that it's going to be a real crunch at this time we're going to need some help in terms of the human resources to deliver services how are we going to do this does it mean part-time staff hiring contract staff um, and maybe that's the time you think about how do you use volunteers in your organization? When do you use volunteers? So that's another part of the budget process as well. Um, thinking about the human resources and where volunteers fit into it and what's appropriate for volunteers to be doing. They can't do the work. They, they aren't replacing staff. They can support. Um, there might be some roles where it's very useful to have volunteers, but they can't do everything. And you need to understand what volunteers can and can't do in terms of delivering services in your organization. So go to expenses, um, different types of expenses, fixed and variable. So the fixed things, fixed costs, those are things that don't vary with the level of activity in your organization. Things like rent, insurance, um, probably a lot of staffing costs. You're going to have those expenses regardless of how big your organization is. The variable costs are the things that are going to vary with the number of participants served. Your program supplies. Um, if you're running a program where there's a certain type of training, so you can determine how much does it cost to train each participant in the program. So if you have 50 participants, you know what it's going to cost. If you had 100 participants, it's going to cost that much more. And it's important to understand what's fixed and what's variable um, in your budget. And again, this is very useful um, not that we're talking about it today, but it, when it comes to monitoring your budgets and when you see that there's, you're, you're going over your budget or under your budget, actually knowing that variable cost, and I'll use training as an example, if your training costs are, seem to be higher than you expected, is it because you're training more people or is it because the training costs per person are actually more than what you actually budgeted? So that's an important distinction to um, to be aware of because it, it indicates different things going on. So when you do your budget, you kind of want to know how much does it cost per person to train. I'm using training as an example. That's an easy one. So the program plan, and this is the program, how you're going to deliver the program, deliver the service, that provides the information regarding the variable expenses and really all the expenses. One of the other lines that I find isn't budgeted very well is sales and promotion or marketing. A lot of people say that, you know, we're going to do some promotion during the year, but there's just a number in there. There's no actual plan. So I always like to, that's another line that I look at because if people say they want to do a brochure, and then when it comes time to do the brochure, they realize, well, this actually costs a lot more than what I thought, and there's not enough money in the promotion, in the promotion line. So when I see promotion in a budget, I like to see that people have thought about what do you mean by promotion? What exactly are you promoting? How are you going to, when are you going to promote? Again, it's like taking the time to actually map out what's going to happen during the year. What type of promotion materials are needed? And then 
if you've done that, then you can budget for promotion more accurately so that you know you have enough money rather than just putting, I'll put a thousand dollars into promotion, we'll figure out when we get there. And then finally, the other thing is the overhead costs. And these are the costs that you can't charge to a particular program or service, service insurance, audit, legal, it's all types of things that the cost of the organization, but there's no corresponding revenue for it. Um, but it really applies to all programs. So it's, that's really the big challenge, is how do you get the money to pay for all of these core costs? So internally for your organization, you might want, you should have a policy on how you do cover them. And the way um, many organizations will do it is you do it based on a percentage. So each budget will charge 10% or 15% of the actual expenses as administration. When you're doing some government um, contracts, very often they will tell you we allow 10% for administration or 15% for administration. And that's the other term you'll, you'll hear, administration core costs, basically the same things. Any project, any budget you do, you want to make sure you get the maximum amount of administration out of it. So if there's 15% administration, make sure that you include the 15% administration in that budget. Internally in our organization, I actually charge out to individual programs um, and administration charts so that everybody in the organization understands what these costs are. I've been in many situations where the staff don't understand this administration. They think it's just head office taking the money. And so it's really an education for everybody, both internally and externally, that these costs, the organization wouldn't exist without them. We need insurance. Your program's not going to run if we don't have insurance. We have to have an audit. The funders require us to have audited statements. There's a board. There's an expense to having a board. Um, so that's why I find it useful to actually include that internally in statements that I do, that I included a line for administration so that everyone's aware what the real cost of running your program is, not just the direct cost that they actually see. There's other costs that they aren't seeing the invoices, but there is a cost to your program beyond the direct program costs. So now, how do you know whether the budget's right or not? So you're getting a budget, and this could be, this could be a few situations. Maybe you um, want to get your budget approved, or maybe someone's giving you a budget and you have to make a decision, is this budget okay or not? Do I pass this on? So some of the things that I look at, if it, especially on an organizational level, what percentage of the revenue is confirmed? So in, generally, I don't like I don't put in government revenue unless I have a contract for it because that can be very dangerous if you're assuming that contracts are going to be renewed. So if you have your budget in your budget, a contract which goes through nine months and you the last three months, it's probably going to be renewed but you're not sure, I wouldn't put it in there. I don't put it in the budget unless it's confirmed. And so when I look at a budget or when our board looks at a budget, I know that they want to know how much is confirmed um, how much do we still have to raise? And then what's the probability of raising remaining revenue that's in the budget? So is it a stretch goal? So for fundraising, um, you know, if we raised $100,000 last year and you're putting a budget in for $110,000, they might think, you know, 10%, okay, we can do that. If you're going from 100000 to 250000 then eyebrows might be raised and say, okay, that's a huge increase. How exactly do you think you're going to do that? So you want to know the probability around that. So I always look at comparisons year over year to see what the increases are and to see if there's an explanation of how we're going to get there. The other thing that I would look at is what could be cut from the budget if the revenue targets are not met? So there's always something in the revenue that might not be confirmed at the beginning of the year or usually. I mean, if you have it confirmed, that's great. But if there's something that's not there, what happens? It's sort of the scenario. What happens if we don't raise the money? So are there expenses that we could hold off on and not spend now until we know that the money comes in? So you don't have to spend everything the first month of the year. So that's the type of question that I would ask as well. Some other ones. How much will it cost to raise the revenue? 
So when I look at the fundraising budget, it costs money to raise money. So it's fine. If you see a big increase in fundraising, I would expect to see an increase in fundraising costs. And I would re very, I'd look very closely at how much is it actually going to cost to raise the money and, is, and has that expense been included? Because all too often the way budgets are balanced in the end is you add a bit more to the fundraising target. And you give fundraisers and say, okay, you're going to have to raise more money. But very rarely do people actually put in any extra money in the expense side to raise it. So you can say, you know, special events, how much is it actually going to cost you? to raise that money in the special event. So you want to see that. Um, how many staff are budgeted? This is a big thing because staffing is probably the busy, this biggest expense in any budget. So how many staff are in there? How many are permanent and how many are contract? Or how many are part-time? Because you want to know if you have any flexibility in there. So if things change, if somebody's part-time, can you, you know, reduce their hours or maybe you want to increase their hours if something comes along? Are people on contract? So you have a government contract and it ends in a year. Are the staff working on that contract? Are you committed to them permanently or when the contract's up, their, their contract's up as well? Do those things coincide? And you need to be careful about that. Um, you might get a lot of project funding and I generally would recommend that when you're hiring staff and if, if it really is a one-time project, you hire them for the six months, the one year, rather than have them on permanently because at the end of that year, you may not be able to afford to keep them. And just to be fair to the person, they should know you're hired for this contract. We have a one-year contract and sometimes it's not even one year. Just so, so that they're aware of that, so that you don't get caught in a situation where you have these staff and you have no money to um, pay for them. I ask about volunteers, if volunteers are required to do the work. Um, when you look at the whole plan, what, the org what you're planning to do, are, is there enough staff to do the work? Are volunteers involved? Are there any expenses related to volunteers? Because volunteers cost money and people's time. I mean, it's easy to say you can get a lot of volunteers. Who's going to manage all these volunteers? Who's going to recruit them and train them and support them? And what's in the budget on the expense side to take care of all this? Who is going to actually take care of all of these volunteers? So that's something that I would ask about. Similar to before, are there any expenses that could be held back until revenue targets are assured? So sometimes there's expenditures. It could be something like computers. So you put in your budget that you want to replace some computers, but you might not do it in the beginning of the year. You might do it in the last half of the year once you know that, okay, our budget looks good. We're going to have enough money. We can purchase these computers. Otherwise, you know, we're going to be a bit short on revenue. You know, we might not buy three computers, maybe we'll only buy two. So it's just knowing what type of expenses, you know, that you could hold back until you know that the money's coming in. Are there contingencies built in the budget into the budget? I always ask that question. Um, because you want to know that there's something in there because every budget, and I can't imagine a budget where there hasn't been something unexpected happen during the year. So you want to know that there are contingencies and where they are. And is there a cash flow budget? And particularly if you have one funder, smaller organizations, it's really important. But it's not only when cash is tight. If you have a lot of cash, I also want to see a cash flow budget because maybe that cash that you have, you've got money sitting in a bank account for six months of the year. I mean, I know you can't make a lot of money on cash right now, but maybe that could be put somewhere where you can make a bit of interest on the money. So that's another reason why people want it. I want to see what the cash flow is. If it's very low or if it's very high, there's still decisions to be made. And people focus on if we don't have enough cash, but it's just as important to manage cash when you have a lot of it. Thanks, Eric. I just want to jump in for a second. Uh, we've had one question come in and two others that have been sitting there. So we have three questions. Um, and so uh, I know you have, have some more material. I just want to point out, please do send your questions and comments in. We would really like to, to, to do them. Let me, can I jump in and, be, and then you can go back to your presentation? Here's a couple uh, questions that we have for you. Um, how do you account for volunteers in your budget? That's an interesting one because the volunteers 
don't actually appear in a formal budget that you see and because you're not paying them, they're unpaid. What I do with budgets is I have a section sort of below the numbers labeled volunteers where I actually put in some information about the volunteers. Things like how many volunteers do we expect to have in the program? Um, what type of roles the volunteers have in terms of the program in service delivery? In the budget, in the actual budget itself, where you might see something is volunteer training. And this depends on how many volunteers are in your organization. So for example, in our organization, we have a lot of volunteers. We have over 2,000 volunteers, so that's a, that's a line item. Volunteer training is a line item. If you only have a few volunteers, it might not be huge in terms of dollars, but it is an important part of the budget. And again, it's why I say that the notes are important. So you would have a specific section to, that speaks to volunteers in the organization. That's how I would handle that. Thanks, Eric. Uh, another question. What is best practice for reserve funds in terms of, you know, what should you have set aside? This is a good question. And reserve funds are basically funds are set aside. You would use that in an emergency. Um, generally, reserve funds, you might have it there if you lost your major funder. All of a sudden, your major funder is gone, and what are you going to do? You need some time to replace that funding. In some cases, an organization may have to wind up its operations. In either case, you need some money to do that, even to wind up operations. So there's not a rule out there that says you need to have X amount of reserve funds. Practice, and what you hear a lot of people say is, three months worth of operating dollars would be a good amount to have in the reserve fund. And in practice, that's really difficult to do. Um, because to generate reserve funds, Essentially, you're not going to generate any extra money on government contracts because whatever the government gives you, you have to spend it. If you don't spend it, it goes back to them. So where you're generating the reserve funds is generally through if you have fee-for-service. Um, I mentioned if you have a lot of cash and you invest it, maybe the income that you earn on those funds could be put into a reserve fund. It takes years to build up a reserve fund. Um, three months is sort of... Uh, that might be a goal um, in terms of if you could have too much. The one thing I have seen, and, and it doesn't happen very often just because it is difficult to generate that money, some funders will ask if you have a reserve fund. If they saw that you had six months or more, they might question whether you really need the money. There's so many people that are asking for money. If you actually had six months worth of money that you aren't spending, a funder might think, you know what? There's other people that might need the money more than you. And even your donors might question that as well. Um, if you build up so much money, they could question why aren't you spending that on programs. At the same time, I think funders and governments too want to know if you have a reserve fund because it shows you you're managing your finances well. It's prudent to have a reserve fund. That shows that you actually thought about it, that something could happen down the road and you have some money so that People will, if you have a reserve fund, people could look at that and say, well, you know what, at least I know that organization. They can handle this. Um, they've prepared themselves. I, I have confidence that they're going to be around for a while, that they're not going to run out of money and not exist. So I think having a reserve fund is good in terms of the amount. You could use three months of operating as sort of a goal, just knowing that it's very hard to get to that goal. Many organizations don't have any reserve fund, but I think it's good practice to start one. Um, and one more question, and I'm hoping that some of you out there will write in some more questions and comments. The uh, um, question was asked about contingency, uh, adding cushion uh, to line items. Current reality is funders are maintaining flat line budgets, so when costs increase, for example, benefits or insurance, the funder doesn't give more. That, um, that's very true, um, and I, I've seen that myself. We've had budgets that have been the same for years, and so even for our salary increases, it's not covered in there, which is why more and more, and certainly I've seen this in organizations, people are looking for, you almost need to supplement what the government gives you, and you're looking for some kind of, um, either have to do it through fundraising or fee-for-service or trying to generate more money that makes up for what the government isn't paying, because it is a challenge, um, and I, don't, I really don't think it's going to change. I don't think there's a lot more money going to come 
um, from the government, but it's very true. Benefits, salaries, I know insurance, years ago when insurance went up, they don't want to pay for those things, but that's the cost of, that's the cost of running the program. Certainly with private sector funders, we want to put, I always put in the full cost, make sure that you get the full cost. Where you're not getting it, that's where you need, and maybe as an organization, you need a strategy to raise undesignated dollars, money that's not tied to the government, and that could be fundraising, that could be fee-for-service, however, and that's really the solution to um, government cutbacks or where the government's basically putting a hold on budgets. Thanks, Eric. So it's 11.41, and we're targeted to end at noon. So there's no more questions right now. I'll be monitoring, and if they come in, I'll, I'll jump in, Eric, but I'll hand it back to you. Okay, just a couple more things. Um, so one of the things is when you're looking at a budget is how do you evaluate whether it's reasonable or not. So comparing it to a prior year you knowing with knowledge of the changes is one of the things I look for. So you know what the program you know how you ran the program last year. I see the budget for this year. Are the increases or decreases reasonable? And that's why the notes are really important, the things around the assumption. What's happening in the economy? What's happening with demographics? What's happening politically? With knowledge of all of that, and I look at the budget, does it make sense what's in the budget? Are all the expenses in there that should be um, in the budget? Um, one of the other things, and sometimes this can be used, is using ratios. Um, you can evaluate a budget uh, looking at the cost per participant or the revenue per participant. This is, happens a lot where you're actually servicing a number of people and you can actually put a dollar amount for how much is the cost to serve an individual. And just comparing it year to year. So if you served, you know, 200 individuals last year and it cost this amount of money, how many individuals are you serving this year and how much is it going to cost per individual? Ratios are good because even though the numbers could be quite different, the ratio will be the same. And I just put an example, 10 over 100 is 10%, 1,000 over 10,000 is 10%. So regardless of the size, you can look at the ratios. And so that's something that I think is, um, sometimes that can be important. And again, this it's, it's going to vary from program to program. I do, and one of the things about prior year that, I'll, that I want to point out, some of the dangers in budgeting and looking at the prior year. Sometimes when people code expenses, they're not necessarily coded to the right place, which is another reason I like to do zero-based budgeting. So people go through the year, and you're at the max for your budget line, but you've got more to spend, but you've got extra money in some other line. So instead of... Um, coding something to program materials, they'll code it to promotion or office expense so they don't look bad. So that way you don't show that you've overspent in one particular line or not. I always, always want people to code expenses where they belong. If you're over in a program expenses, I want to see that. If you're under in another line, I want to see that because that's the only way you budget properly the next year. I've seen budgets, and I can give you an example, and it was a childcare budget once. Every year the food costs was never right at all that they're going over budget in food. And what we finally realized is what they were doing is when they came to the maximum of their food costs, they were quoting it elsewhere. So people were looking at the previous year's budget and seeing, oh, food seems in line, they budgeted this amount every year, that's how much shows up in the actuals. But in reality, they were spending far more than that in the food costs. They just didn't want to show it in food because they were afraid to show that they were overspent, so they hid it somewhere else. And that really defeats the purpose. So when you're you don't have an accurate reflection of what's going on, and it does affect your budgeting. So that meant year after year we were doing these terrible budgets because it really, the budget didn't reflect reality. And so that's the, the danger of looking at prior year, comparing things to the prior year. So just want to look at just an overall review in terms of budgets. We looked at the three types of budgets, the operating, the capital, cash flow looked at some of the approaches to budgeting, and as I said, I like to involve, the more people you involve, the better, because then they take some ownership over the budget too. You get that buy-in when everyone's involved in the budgeting, and you actually learn a lot when program staff actually do a budget. They can come up with some really good ideas that maybe um, you haven't thought about. Sometimes it's getting a group of people together to do a budget. 
rather than one person doing a budget in isolation, get three or four people, maybe they're all doing their own budgets, and just talk to each other because you can learn from each other different experiences. People may have had different experiences in other organizations on how they've done things or maybe they can share resources in some ways. So in terms of approach to budgeting, I really like zero base and I like a lot of people involved. I, get, I think you get a better budget, I think you get a better tie-in, uh, buy-in from staff. And then best practices, we talked about those. Um, and really, the more you do budgets, the better you get at it. It's just, it's a matter of practice. Practice, practice. The more budgets you do, the more you learn. That's how I came up with my little checklist for laughing and all of those things. And finally, the evaluation. And when, you, when I think of evaluation, think of, think of it as um, your board's going to approve your budget or not. Put yourself in that position if you saw a budget or one of your colleagues' budgets. How would you know, what would, questions would you ask if it's your decision to approve? Maybe there's two, but there's two programs and we're going to fund one of them. How would you make that decision? How would you go through and look through the budget? Or think of you know, government funders. How many people apply for all the funding? How do they go about evaluating it? So think of it in terms of the funder, and that will help you. One, I think it will help you make good notes, because the better your notes are, the better your chances of actually getting it funded. And you know, think, about, um, think about your board uh, for your organization, what types of things that they would want to ask and think about the contingencies in there. So that sort of wraps up what um, I wanted to talk about in terms of budgeting, but if you have any questions about budgeting, or I'm uh, happy to try and help. Great. Well, let me just start off. We don't have anything right now that's come in. We're waiting on you. Uh, if you have any other questions or comments, please send them in. In the meantime, let me ask you, uh, I had mentioned earlier on uh, that to keep kind of a, a bright ideas list or some issues that you think would be valuable um, and then put them, uh, write them down or you could tell us how many ideas you came out with. So if there's no more questions coming in right now and we'll keep an eye to see, um, then we'll uh, just to take a look at and see how many ideas did you write down uh, that you're going to be able to use. And I'm going to pass it over to, uh, to Yolanda. Okay, so we understand. Thank you very much, um, Eric. Uh, 90 minutes, you know, it's not enough to cover everything. And basically, so we understand that it, you know, it was a very brief information. We looked at the, from the perspective of uh, risk management. We, this webinar is one of five on risk management. However, we do have, we do offer much, like I mean, more resources on advanced financial management. And as a matter of fact, we do have self-directed online training, which is available at our website www learn at work one word dot ca so i encourage all of you to go there we do have six modules basically this is really like more in depth information module 1 deals with financial statements and um, reports module 2 with budget budgets, forecasts, and reserve funds. I know, Eric, you just <laughs> briefly touched some of them. Module 3, financial analysis. Module 4, audits. Financial sustainability, module 5. And risk management, module 6. So basically more in-depth information. This is a very well-developed, you know, training with voiceover. And you can, you have quizzes. So on your own time, just go and whatever questions Eric uh, would you know like raise or whatever like issues you go and you will find more information also one more it's really good news um, we are going to have in person in the classroom training and um, as you are probably you are aware over the last year we delivered 12 uh, sessions on advanced management financial management um, um, topic and be, of, across Ontario. This year we are planning to deliver six more. The training was, Eliza, was delivered by Elizabeth Way, the president of Stratagems. It was de developed and delivered. 
the, the first session, one full day session is coming, it will be delivered on April 20, 28. So it will be on Saturday. We just decided to go on Saturday, deliver on Saturday, basically to, uh, because the time wise. We know that your board members, they work at different organizations, so they will be available basically on, on Saturday. So this is the training for um, EDs for top financial people and for your board members. Saturday, April 28. So please look at, you know, like Petra will be sending um, more information. Okay, so just, just please uh, register. So back to David and Eric. Thank you very much, uh, Eric. It's really very, very practical, uh, you know, to the point uh, information. So, David. Thank you, Lanza, and uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with her and her staff here, and Petra, who's in the room here. Um, let me ask the question then, uh, how many of you, uh, or I know that amazingly, all of you have stayed on the line, except for I think one person's left, uh, how many of you had some practical things you wrote down, um, and maybe you can give me a number, uh, three things, five things, and just write it in the, in the question or chat box and hit enter. And let's just see how many of you had some uh, practical things that you learned today. Uh, five things, three things, two things, one thing that you can actually use. I'd love to see that number if you don't mind just typing it in. So thank you, Luciana. Two. Uh, Noel, four things. Uh, three, thank you, Valley. Three, Marion. Thank you. And anybody else out there want to type in a seven from Lynn? Hmm. Faye just says thank you. I appreciate that. How many other? Now, if you have anything practical uh, in terms of that you that you might type out that you actually learned today that was real value, uh, maybe a concept or topic, and you could tell us what that was, that'd be great as well. All right, so. A number of you just writing in the number of things that you uh, that you that you list. Okay. Well, we're just real grateful that you came today, uh, and looking forward to hearing from you next. Uh, and and uh, we'll be talking about the co concept of governance and really engaging. Uh, your board so that you have a very, very strong situation. Some, uh, Faye, you wrote down frontline staff's involvement in budgeting help with accountability and buy-ins. That was something that you uh, really picked up today. Um, uh, thank you for writing that down. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Same time, same place and really hope that you have a fantastic week. I know you do great work. We really appreciate it. In the presentation, I've given both my email address and Eric's email address. We would be glad to provide uh, uh, feedback to a question that you might have, and we're just real grateful. Uh, those of you who sent in questions over the last week, with uh, fantastic. We'd love to engage you on issues. If you have board issues you're dealing with and you want to think about them before next week and send them to me, fantastic. I can build it into the presentation. Thank you so much for those of you who joined today. Uh, and from Okasi, we just want to say have a fantastic day.